Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of True Crime. I'm your host, Drew V, and for my sixth episode, I will be covering the baffling case of Tamla Horsford. I choose the word baffling not because of the evidence that is presented in this case, but also by how the investigation was conducted throughout the course of Tamla's story. This case involves a woman, Tamil Horsford, who was attending an adult birthday party sleepover with 11 other people on November 3rd, 2018 in Cumming, Georgia, located in a very conservative Forsyth County. According to an article from the Daily Beast in 2020, Forsyth is Georgia's richest and fastest growing county with a median income nearly 40,000 more than the state average. It is also the state's most conservative. A 2000 ranking from Tucker Carlson's Daily Caller ruled Forsyth the second most conservative-friendly county in the nation, a title that seemed to stick in 2016 when Donald Trump took roughly 72% of the county vote, compared to 51% of Georgia as a whole. That same year, the Forsyth County GOP changed its logo so that the F sported a Trump-style toupee. The county is also remarkable for its lack of diversity. Just 4% of the population is black, compared to 32% of the rest of the state. The birthday party that night was being thrown for a woman named John Myers at her residence, and it included nine women, two men, and one husband, who, according to police interviews, only dropped off and picked up his wife. Out of these 11 people, eight were planning to spend the night, as was Tamla. The party would start out with some college football, booze, singing happy birthday, and ending the night with a game of Cards Against Humanity. Tamla was said to be having a good time while she was attending the party. She was conversing with everyone, drinking imported tequila that she brought, smoked a few cigarettes, and even at one point stepped out back for a moment with a couple others to puff on a little bit of marijuana. As the night would go on, a few people would leave the party early while all the others would stay the night. Guests staying the night would start to trick off to bed one by one while everyone else except Tamla had gone home for the evening, thus leaving Tamla alone by herself downstairs. According to people attending the party late, Tamla said she was going to eat some gumbo, smoke a cigarette, and then go to bed in one of the spare bedrooms in the home. As the next morning approached, people from inside the home would start to wake up, but only to notice a startling discovery in the backyard of John's home. This startling discovery in the backyard would turn out to be a woman, lying face down in the grass, wearing a dog paw print onesie, arms to her side. Also, she was motionless, and that woman was 40-year-old mother of five, Tamla Horsford. 911 was then called by the homeowner, John, and just minutes later, law enforcement arrived on the scene. But this would be just the beginning to a bizarre and very questionable case. You'll notice as the story unfolds that law enforcement approaches this case very casually and even exhibits some strange behavior and tactics along the way, some of which are completely unheard of. Tamla's death would quickly be ruled an accident by law enforcement, saying Tamla was alone in the backyard that night under the influence and fell from the second story balcony of John's home. The case was then quickly closed months later, but due to a very questionable conclusion and public outrage, Tamla's case was then reopened once again, reinvestigated, but to only come up with the same questionable outcome as the first time the case was closed, and the ruling still remains today that Tamla's death was an accident. A little bit about Tamla. Tamla Horsford was born in St. Vincent in the Caribbean in 1978, and her family moved to the Bronx in 1989. Tamla later moved to Florida where she would meet her husband Leander. Tom and Leander would have five children of their own, and Leander also had a daughter from a previous relationship who seemed to be close with Tamla as well. Tamla and her family would then relocate to Georgia for Leander's job, and Tamla was considered to be a very dedicated stay-at-home and involved football mom. Tamla was said to be friendly, and she also had a large personality that many people were drawn to. Everything I've read or heard about Tamla so far has been so positive, so if her death wasn't an accident, then what reason would someone want to have to hurt her that night? While researching this case, I found a great YouTube channel called Justice for Tamla Horsford slash Forsyth Exposed. And this channel is pretty much the holy grail when it comes to information on Tamla's case. This YouTube channel provides numerous hours of law enforcement interviews with almost every person involved in this case, including a couple neighbors that have some pretty interesting insight on this case, and even an ex-girlfriend of the lead detective on this case, Michael Christensen, before he resigned. I probably listened to all of the interviews included with this case two or three times, really trying to grasp what the hell may have happened to Tamla that night. The 10 other people who were attending the party that night were all interviewed twice, some even three times along the course of this case. 
In my opinion, there are a lot of conflicting statements among the other party goers in the interviews. And you'll really notice both that the Forsyth County Sheriff Office and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation really didn't press this group of people for information like we normally see in these types of situations. The author of this channel also provides videos with her insight on Tamla's case, and whoever you are, I can't thank you enough for the amount of work you have put into this channel. Also, there's a great website called ForsythExposed.com, and it too provides a lot of interesting information on this case, and is definitely worth a look at as well. So please continue to join me on the rest of this episode as I share Tamla's story. Then I'd like to talk about a couple theories people have about this case, and in the end, really try and come up with a better conclusion than we've already heard before. This is Drew Crime, Episode 6, Tamla Horsford. <laughs> I know you, I know you do, and you feel that way, but you should talk to your lawyer. I'm ready to let you. Back then, was the man I am, I absolutely don't know nothing about. And they frame me, they frame me. Yeah, they frame me. I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, they frame me. The clowning was relaxation for me. I enjoyed entertaining kids. Like some people are, uh, you know, they, they unwind in different ways, either for going out drinking or that. I could put on clown makeup and I was relaxed. And I enjoyed doing it. I fight for my life. Y'all killing me with this. I can't help 30 years of my going to help me. 30 years of my career. But y'all trying to kill me. You're killing me, man. Now, before we begin Tamla's story, all my Drew Crime episodes can be found on Spotify, Apple Music, Anchor, Amazon Music, and many more. Also, all my podcast episodes can be listened and viewed on my Drew Crime YouTube channel, so please subscribe if it's something you're interested in, and always feel free to leave any comments that you may have on my episodes. If for any reason you need to reach me or would just like to discuss a case, I can be found on Facebook at facebook.com slash drewcrime, also on Twitter at hashtag drewcrime, or you may just even email me at drewcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Also, a friendly reminder, everything I do discuss on this podcast is based on pure speculation, which comes from the research I've done, where I then later form my own opinions on these cases and all sources for my episodes will be included in the episode descriptions of each episode. One last thing before I begin discussing this case, I just wanted to kind of list off all the people who were attending the party that night, just so you have a general idea of who everyone was. Starting off, we all know that Tamla was attending that night, John Myers, who is the homeowner, Jose Barea, who was John's boyfriend at the time, Madeline Lombardi, who is John's aunt, Tom and Stacy Smith, who are married and friends of John, and then all the rest were friends of John as well. Sarah Cockerham, Nicole Lawson, Jen Morrell, Paula Seals, Marcy Harden, and Bridget Fuller. So now, with all that being said, I'd like to dive right into the questionable case of Tamla Horsford. Tamla's story, again, would start out on Friday, November 3rd, 2018 in Cumming, Georgia. Tamla was at home getting ready for an adult sleepover birthday party that she was invited to by a woman named Stacy Smith. Tamla and Stacy knew each other because some of their kids played on the same football team and the two had hung out before on a separate few occasions as well. So before Tamla would leave her house that night, she would prepare a casserole for the morning for her five boys and husband Leander. According to Leander, Tamla didn't even feel like going to the party in the first place, but she did want to be cool with these people, so she felt the need to go. Tamla would then leave her house and she would arrive at John's residence around 8.30 p.m. Tamla was the second to last to arrive at the birthday party that evening, and after she had arrived, she went and changed into her dog paw print onesie pajamas that she had brought along. Tamla also had brought along a bottle of tequila as a gift for Jean's birthday, and Tamla has been said by others to be the only one who drank from it that night. Now, it was only supposed to be an all-female birthday slumber party, but there were two men in the basement watching football when Tamla arrived. The two men downstairs were Stacy's husband Thomas and John's then boyfriend Jose, who ends up playing a big role in this case and we will definitely talk about Jose a little bit later. Thomas and Jose were hanging out at John's house that night because Jose didn't feel like going out and wasn't feeling too well, and Thomas had another function going on in his house that he didn't want to be there for. 
So then all the gals were upstairs drinking, conversing, and watching the LSU vs. Alabama game on TV. Then once the football game reached halftime around 10 p.m., the two men would come up from the basement and join the ladies to sing happy birthday to Jean. At this point, the last party goer Paula would show up, while two other gals from the party, Sarah and Nicole, would say their goodbyes and leave the party early. Since LSU was getting blown out by Alabama, everyone at the party continued to mingle after singing happy birthday. Aunt Madeline, who lived downstairs at the time, would go to bed down in the basement bedroom. The men left for a moment to go get some more ice. Then Tamla would FaceTime her husband, Lee. And then once the boys got back from getting ice, everyone was getting ready to play a game of Cards Against Humanity. While playing the game, Tamla then decided to FaceTime her pregnant stepdaughter to say hi to everyone at 12.32 a.m. And according to Tamla's phone log that I saw from that night, Tamla's phone was last used at 12.52 a.m. So now the card game was said by guests to not last very long and it started to wind down shortly before 1 a.m. And this is when most partygoers said they would start to trickle off to bed, leaving Tamla downstairs with one other guest, Bridget, who was waiting for a ride from her husband. I do have to point out real quick that according to Tom and Stacy, before they went to bed, Tamla had mentioned something about wanting to go home. But Tom and Stacy said they told Tamla it wasn't a good idea and, and just tried to sleep it off and stay the night. Then Bridget's husband Gary would arrive to pick her up and Bridget said she and Tamla would say their goodbyes, hug, and then Bridget left opening and closing the front door at 1.47 a.m. And this is according to the Xfinity door system that John had in her house at the time. Now at this point, everyone is either supposedly asleep or is left for the night except for Tamla. And according to the door sensors, after Bridget had left at 1.47 a.m., the back door to the balcony would open up at 1.49 a.m. and then close at 1.50 a.m. Then, a few minutes later, at 1.57 a.m., the door sensor log shows the back door opening again. But this time, the door would never close. It's also important to know that the next morning on November 4th, it was daylight savings. So it is kind of hard to say if all the times that have been given to us in the story are 100% accurate. So as the early morning hours would approach, one of the guests that stayed the night, Marcy, would wake up early Sunday morning and leave out the front door at 4.10 a.m. Marcy worked at Coach in the nearby outlet malls at the time, and she said she needed to get home to get ready for work. Then it was reported that the door sensor would go off again at 7.45 a.m., and this time it was Paula leaving that morning to head back home. Then the last reported time of the front door opening was 8.30 a.m., and this was Tom and Stacy leaving the house headed back to their house as well. According to a neighbor across the street, Tom and Stacy were seen leaving Jean's house carrying a crockpot, and we will talk about that a little bit more later as well. So back inside the house, Jean's Ann Madeline said she would wake up around 8.30 that morning. She would then lie in bed for about 15 minutes before going out to the basement to make coffee. Madeline then said she went to start the coffee maker, looked out the window, and then noticed the dog paw pajamas that Tamla was wearing the night before lying on the ground in the backyard. Madeline then says she knelt to the ground on her knees and said a prayer, and then ran upstairs to knock on John's bedroom door. After Madeline knocked, she said she could hear what sounded like water running, so she assumed that somebody was probably taking a shower. So she went back downstairs and looked out the window once more to see if Tamla had moved or not, but there was still no movement from Tamla's body. So Madeline ran back upstairs, passing a now awake partygoer Jen, and this time knocked much louder on John's door, and this time she would get a response to come in. Madeline entered John's bedroom and let her know that her friend from the islands was in the backyard and she wasn't moving. According to John in her first interview with Detective Mike Christensen on November 9th, 2018, this was her account of what would happen next. She said she came upstairs and knocked. I didn't hear her the first time. I heard the second time. Right. Woke us up and she said, I need Jose. And I could just tell by the tone of her voice in her face that it was bad. So he pulled on his shorts and he started coming down and he hollered at me, get your phone. I couldn't even tell you unless we pulled the security for the door. If I came out this door or the basement, like mm -hmm. it just a whirlwind. And then when I got down there, I stayed on the gravel because I could see it. Like it, it's still surreal of her. She was like that. And I handed Jose my phone, cause I'd already, I had 911 on the phone. Handed him my phone and he touched her back. Cause I was like, don't touch her. And he's like, we have to. 
because he was on the phone and he touched her and he said, she's not breathing. And then he went, I think he touched her leg to see if it would bend. Mm. And he said, rigor mortis is already set in, she's gone. So 911 had already been called by Jean, and she then passed off the phone to Jose, who was now speaking to dispatch. And the 911 call is pretty long, so I'm just going to play a summarized version here for you. And real quick, I just wanted to add that it was about 14 minutes in between Madeline finding Tamla's body and the 911 call being placed. Forsyth County, 911. Hi, yes, um, I, I need an ambulance. I'm afraid to my home. What's the address? All right, 4450 Woodlick Court. What is your name? My name is John Myers, J-E-A-N-N-E. Okay, what's going on? Um, we had people over last night when we were drinking. Most of us went to bed. One of them stayed on the balcony. She was drinking, and we just went out outside, and she's laying face down in the backyard. It looks like me. I'm guessing maybe she fell off the balcony, but she's stiff. Okay, is she breathing? I, I don't know. I don't know if she's face down. Okay. Oh. Here, hold on. Hey, this is Jose Barrera. Hey, have y'all checked to see if she's breathing? She's not moving one bit. She's not breathing. Um, okay. I just try to assess her Tesla. She's completely face down in the yard. Um, she is stiff. Do you know if she... Um, do you see blood or anything? Where she I don't know if I should move her over. I mean, she's completely face down. Okay. I mean, can you just check and see if she's breathing? If, if she's not breathing and you, and you know she's gone, then just leave her where she's at. If she... Okay. I'm completely not sure. Okay. And that's the only blood that you would see? That's what I can see without moving her over. I haven't okay. seen her face. Do you know if she was suicidal at all? I have no clue. I've met her one other time. Um, you know, like my girlfriend said, people were over last night, and she was the last one I saw before everybody. I mean, everybody was typically put off to bed. And she was the last one in the kitchen. She was just either waiting around for a ride or waiting until the morning. How far is the um, where she would have fell from? How far is the deck from the ground? Um, I would probably say... Maybe 20 feet. Was she there with anyone else? I don't believe anybody was. Uh, my girlfriend has cameras here on the back deck that we can check. Okay. That I think would have caught the incident if she fell from here. Again, I, I, true, I don't know. How, it's, it's hard to say if she fell from, from the deck or if she was already downstairs. She was the only... Okay, I'm so sorry about that. So you think she's possibly out um, smoking? Yeah, she was, she was the only smoker. I mean, I'm, I'm on the back deck right now, and, you know, cigarette lighter, that type of thing are out here. Um, okay. So I'm just trying to see where I'm going to on where this money came from. Are all the people that were there last night, are they still at your house? Okay, there are four people that were here last night that are no longer here. And they just left this morning, or they leave last night? Uh, we, 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 we can check. Or, you know, she's got an alarm system that gives alerts when the doors are open on her phone. Okay. But I would, I, I think the last time that I personally saw Tam was probably about one in the morning before I'd gone upstairs to bed. Okay. And and at that point, she was the only one in the kitchen. Okay. Now, at this point, the only people that were left inside the house from that night were Jean, Jose, Aunt Madeline, and another party goer that had stayed over and just woke up, Jen. And real quick, I just wanted to play for you Jen's account of what happened that next morning after she woke up. And this audio is from her first interview with Detective Mike Christensen on November 19th, 2018. And so you saw Madeline or Madeline. And, uh... She came tearing through the kitchen. And I said, good morning. And she was like, hi, kind of a weird hi. And I was like thinking not a morning person. I still mm -hmm. didn't have any idea. And that's about when Jose came kind of right. storming down the stairs. And I said, what's going on? And he just looked at me, turned and went down the basement stairs, I believe, to go outside. And Jean came down behind him. And that's when she said, Tam's not moving. I went to get my shoes on. They were by the front door. So I don't know what Jean was doing. I don't know if she went downstairs and came back up or if she stayed upstairs and was just calling 911. I'm kind of confused on that a little bit 
Um, I do remember Jose saying, no, you got, you cannot go down, you can't go down there. Right. So I don't know if she ever made it down there or not. Um, but I, my understanding as this was all kind of happening was that her aunt, and from talking to her aunt all morning, right. her aunt saw her because she lives on that basement floor. Right. So her aunt's the one who kind of saw her first. The only thing that we didn't talk about just now, but I think you guys already know, is she went out on the deck and left the door ajar. Right. Because when I went to go out on the deck that morning and look over the side of the deck, I didn't have to open the door. It was open a couple of inches. So law enforcement then arrives at John's residence at 9.02 a.m., as well as the deputy coroner, and this is where the investigation starts out a little strange. Not one law enforcement official or anyone present at the house ever decided to try and administer CPR on Tamla that morning. And on top of it, law enforcement that had arrived on the scene had even called off EMTs and the fire department on their route to Jean's that morning. Detectives said that pictures were taken of the crime scene that morning and I was able to find a few of them, which I will have listed in my sources, but fair warning, some of them are tough to look at. Tamla's body was then taken away in a gurney and transported to the coroner's office where they would conduct an autopsy two days later on November 6 by Dr. Andrew Koopminers. All the while Tamla was being transported, law enforcement had John call back everyone that had been at the party the night before and told them that they had to come back to her residence. After everyone had returned to John's, law enforcement then kept all the partygoers in two separate groups. The people that were at the home when Tamla's body was discovered were all kept inside, and everyone who had returned were kept outside, and this is when everyone would give their statements from the night before. After statements had been given, law enforcement went over to Tamla's home to give her family the news of her passing, and they also brought back Tamla's vehicle as well. Later on that day, a lot of the people attending the party that night before would stop by Tamla's home with food and to say their condolences to the family. Tamla's family was in complete shock with the news and must have been completely confused on what had happened to her. And something that was really weird to me is that later on, John's mother would end up voluntarily paying for Tamla's funeral, and she even flew in some of Tamla's family members so they could be there as well. You can check out Leander's interview on the Justice for Tamla Horsford YouTube channel, and it gives you a little more idea of what the family was experiencing at this point in time. Now, before I begin to talk about the autopsy report, I just wanted to stop here and talk about the crime scene for a moment. So before law enforcement arrived, Tamla was said by everyone to be face down, arms to the side with her palms faced out. Well, what's interesting is that in the photos of the crime scene and on the investigation report, it's been reported that her left arm was at a 40 degree angle. So the question now is, who moved Tamla's arm and why? In my opinion, her arm was probably moved to make it look like she tried to brace her fall from the balcony. But if Tamla's death is considered an accident, then why would someone go to the trouble to make it look that way? Corporal Miller, Lieutenant Spriggs, and lead detective on this case, Mike Christensen, were all present at the crime scene, and throughout my research, I learned that Corporal Miller has said that he may have moved Tamla's arm to check for a pulse. Only problem with that is, there was no reason for Miller to move her arm to check for a pulse when Tamla's body was found with her arms to her side and palms facing out, which I think would have been a perfect opportunity for him to check a pulse then without having to move her arm at all. Also, in a Rolling Stone article I found, it says, according to a supplemental report from Forsyth County, Berea admitted to it in a call with Lieutenant Andy Kalin. The supplemental report essentially advised that Berea contacted Investigator Kalin on November 7, 2018, and advised that he checked Horford's left arm for a pulse, reads the GPI report. It continues, so Berea did in fact move Horsford's left arm per Investigator Kalin. So either way, I think it's fair to say that one of these men moved Tamla's arm, but again, why? It's also been said in a GBI interview that Jose had contacted Kalin numerous times before the 911 call was ever made that morning. So if this holds true, why was Jose calling this lieutenant that morning while Tamla was being left face down in the grass and unattended to in the backyard? Seems to me that someone may have already known. Tamla Horsford's body had also been found with noticeable abrasions and a broken right wrist with the bone showing through. But what's interesting is there was never any of Tamla's blood found anywhere in the backyard or anywhere at the scene. Also that day, investigators failed to collect any fingerprints from the scene, including inside the home. 
The cameras on the deck that pointed to the back of the home did not work as the batteries were dead and had not been recording, which I will talk about a little later. According to a news source 11alive.com, in an initial report, investigators believe Horsard may have fallen from ground level. The position of the body does not appear that she had fallen directly from the balcony to the ground. Rather, she appeared to have fallen from ground level, with the grade of the yard adding approximately one foot the height of the fall. So wrap your head around this. Initially, law enforcement was saying that Tamla tripped on a piece of landscaping equipment and fell face first on ground level, then suffocated in the grass and died. So later on, after the autopsy report came back, law enforcement changed their findings and then decided she did in fact accidentally fall to her death from the 14 drop off the second story balcony, not from ground level like they had previously said. One last thing about the crime scene before I move on. Detective Christensen was supposedly Snapchatting pictures of the crime scene to a previous girlfriend at the time, and she has also said that Mike didn't even think Tamla's death made sense. Plus, she later says in her interview with the GBI agent that Internal Affairs got a hold of her cell phone later on and destroyed it. You can find this interview on the Tamla YouTube channel, and the audio is pretty choppy, so just turn on the closed captioning and it's not too bad. So, in conclusion to the crime scene, I do feel that something fishy was definitely going on that morning, especially in how they conducted their investigation that day, is still very puzzling. Accident or not, the crime scene and home were never preserved properly, and I believe that crucial evidence was most likely overlooked, and for some reason the rest of the scene didn't seem important that day. Tamla's husband said something from his interview that has really stuck with me, and he said, quote, I don't mind it being an accident, but make it make sense, unquote. So now moving on to the autopsy report that was conducted by the GBI. As for injuries, the medical examiner's report lists Horford had severe injuries of the head, neck, and torso. The report noted there were several superficial abrasions, including on the forehead, above the left eyelid, bridge of the nose, the right temple, and chin. Other injuries included a laceration of the heart, a fractured second vertebrae, and a dislocated wrist. The medical examiner noted there were no facial bones that were broken, but there were several spots of bleeding in the head. A GBI toxicology screening also showed an elevated blood alcohol level of 0.238 and detected traces of THC and the anxiety drug Alprazolam, aka Xanax, in Horford's system at the time of her death, which I will talk about here shortly. Oddly enough though, no pictures were ever taken during the autopsy report, fingernail samples were not taken, and a rape kit was never administered, which is just another few things in this case that is unheard of, and this could only happen from the direction of someone involved. Also, after getting a second opinion, in a letter sent to Horsford's husband, Leander, on June 5, 2020, family attorney Fernandez said his office found conflicting witness statements, a tampered crime scene, mishandled evidence, and unheard of absence of autopsy photos, while Horford's injuries were consistent with being in a physical struggle. So that now leaves the huge question here, was Tamla Horsford attacked the night of the party, and if she was, why would someone want to attack her? So it had been confirmed that there were small traces of Xanax that were found in Tamla's system according to the toxicology report, but what's interesting is Tamla has never been prescribed or even took Xanax, so how did Xanax get into her system? Well, there was a party goer by the name of Bridget that was in possession of Xanax on the night of the party, and after hearing her interviews with law enforcement, she has said she always carries a couple Xanax in her locket which was connected to her necklace, and I also learned she has no problem sharing those drugs with her friends as well. Also, Bridget has said that she was the one who fixed the bowl of gumbo for Tamla that night before she would leave, so there's been large speculation from people that Bridget may have been the possible source of the Xanax found in Tamla's system. The amount of Xanax found in her system was very little, and the amount was equivalent to a small fraction of a normal size Xanax pill. According to Tamil's husband, the Xanax had never even reached Tamil's liver, most likely suggesting she passed away before it was digested. But after doing some research on postmortem death and drugs still in the system, I believe there is another possible reason why the Xanax was never found in Tamil's liver. According to an Australian science article I found and can be found in my sources, within hours of death, bacteria such as E. coli grows and then moves from the in intestinal tract and invades most of the body. This strain of E. coli is a type of bacteria that normally lives inside our intestines where it helps the body break down and digest the food we eat. Many drugs such as some of the benzos, which is Xanax, are metabolized by these bacteria and this lowers the concentration and can even make them disappear entirely. 
After we die, drugs in the liver can be redistributed to nearby tissues, which then can be absorbed by the E. coli distributed into our body from our intestines. Therefore, if this science holds true, then I think it's fair to say there's no way of really telling how much actual Xanax was in Tamla's system before she died, especially since her body was found hours later and rigor mortis was already setting in. Also real quick, a little more science I had found, Tamla's blood alcohol content was right around three times the legal limit. Now I know she had been drinking the night before, but I also think her levels may have become higher after she had passed. The formation of alcohol from sugar after death can falsely imply that the alcohol was there before death, and death could mistakenly be attributed to intoxication. Bacteria can also have the reverse effect and metabolize glucose to alcohol, with alcohol levels at times being above the driving limit. So if this particular science holds true as well, then Tamla's blood alcohol content may have looked higher than it really was. So now while the autopsy and toxicology report were being conducted in the following weeks, all guests from that night would be interviewed by the Forces Sheriff's Office, led by Detective Mike Christensen. What's strange right away about these interviews is the way they're being conducted in the comfort of their own homes. In most cases, possible persons of interest would have to go down to the station or somewhere other than their homes for questioning, but for some reason, the Sheriff's Office decided to do it this way. Now, most of these interviews were conducted on different days, some of them even more than a week apart. During this time frame when interviews were being conducted, John's next door neighbor noticed something very interesting going on over at John's house. According to the next door neighbor's interview with GBI that was conducted later on, all of the people that were present on the night of the party had been coming back over to John's house nightly for what she said was almost two weeks. The neighbor recognized the vehicles that had been there the night of the party, and that's how she knew it was the same people. So the question here is, why did everyone continue to come back to Jean's every night for about two weeks? Well, my speculation is that they were all trying to get some type of story straight, but if none of the party goers supposedly knew what happened to Tamla and it was an accident, then what was there to meet up and talk about for two weeks straight? So now at this point in our story, we know that Tamla attended a birthday slumber party at John's residence where she would mysteriously pass. Everyone attending the party says they have no clue what may have happened to Tamla, and law enforcement has ruled Tamla's death to be an accident. The autopsy and toxicology report have been conducted, and interviews with partygoers and Forsyth sheriffs have been completed. So I had mentioned earlier in the episode that we would talk about John's boyfriend at the time, Jose Berea, a little more. Well, it turns out that Jose was a Forsyth County Superior Court employee who worked as a pretrial release services officer. In that role, he would report bond violations, administer drug and alcohol tests, and identify court defendants who might qualify for pretrial release. Well, on November 7th, three days after Tamla's death, Jose was caught accessing confidential files about Tamla's case, which he would do again on November 20th, and then again on November 28th, where this time he would access files under his girlfriend's name, Jean Myers. Well, the only problem is Jose was not authorized to access these reports, and when the courts found this out, Jose was fired in December, just weeks after Tamla's death. So now this brings huge suspicion towards Jose as to what he was looking for in these reports, and in his interview, he makes it sound like he did nothing wrong. But I guess it was enough wrongdoing to get him fired, and after looking at all the evidence in this case, I couldn't agree more with the decision. So after Jose was caught accessing confidential information, a few months would go by and the autopsy report would finally be released the following year on February 5th, 2019. Then about a few weeks later, a huge shock to many would come over this case and Tamla's death was ruled accidental by the sheriff's office, closing the case on February 20th, 2019, stating it was a party and they were drinking. Tamla's husband and father were notified only an hour before the news conference about her case being ruled accidental and subsequently closed. Oddly enough, around this time, Jean had put her house up for sale in March of 2019, and it ended up being sold fairly quickly, and the house was sold to a local law enforcement official. Well, this closed case conclusion did not sit well with a lot of people, especially after Tamla's case started getting more publicity. From an article I read, after nationwide protests against racial inequality brought renewed public interest in Horford's death, signs with Horford's name were carried at protests in downtown Cumming, Georgia, alongside those with the names of black Americans recently killed by police. Celebrities like T.I. and 50 Cent had posted about Horsford on social media, calling for a new investigation into her death. Over 586,000 people have signed a petition on change.org wanting Horsford's case reopened. 
Well, it turns out that the public outrage would be just enough for now. And in June of 2020, Sheriff Ron Freeman of the Forsyth Sheriff County Office would send a letter to the GBI requesting Tamla's case to be reopened and reinvestigated. Now, this is where the GBI would step in and reinvestigate and re-interview all of the people that were present at the party that night, including neighbors, Detective Mike Christensen, and his ex-girlfriend. Again, these interviews can be found on the Tamla Horsford YouTube channel, and in my opinion, the GBI agents were too soft towards John and her friends, and it almost seemed like the GBI agents were leading them along the way. So after the GBI had finished conducting their own investigation, according to Rolling Stone magazine, in May 2021, Forsyth County District Attorney Penny Penn announced that the GBI had concluded their inquiry and there would not be charges filed in Horsford's death. The GBI largely sided with the Forsyth County investigators, concluding that Horsford's death was caused by an accidental fall from the balcony. So now this is where I will conclude Tamla's story up to this point in time. And now I just want to point out a few extra things about this story I didn't get to. Also, I'll get into a few theories that are out there and then conclude this episode with my speculation on what may have happened to Tamla Horsford. So now there are many parts of the story that I wasn't able to get to and this case is filled with tons of information. And also here are a couple other things I just wanted to touch base on real quick that I had mentioned before. First off, I can't figure out why Tom and Stacy left the next morning with a crockpot. Stacy has never mentioned anything about bringing the crockpot over to John's, and Aunt Madeline, who lived there at the time, is the one who made gumbo for the party that night. Gumbo takes about six hours to cook in a crockpot, so the crockpot had to have already been at John's before Stacy would arrive that day. The only thing I can speculate is that something was inside the crockpot that they needed to get rid of. The reason I say this is because Bridget was the one who said she had made a bowl of gumbo for Tamla before she would leave that night, and Bridget is also the only one that had Xanax on her that evening. So is it possible that Xanax found in Tamla's system possibly came from the gumbo she was served? Well, I certainly think it's plausible, and I also think it's plausible that Tamla's tequila could have been spiked at some point in the night as well. Bridget had said something very interesting in one of her interviews with law enforcement when asked about Tamla taking Xanax at night, and Bridget stated, quote, No, I did not give her anything, and no, I did not see her put anything in her drink, unquote. So the question here for me is, was Bridget trying to imply that someone else put something in Tamla's drink that night? Now, for the second thing I wanted to talk about in this case were the cameras that were located outside of every entrance of John's home. Now, these cameras were said to not be working because the batteries needed to be changed, but no one really knows if that's true or not. This is a highly debated topic in this case, and there are a lot of people out there that believe the cameras were working and that all of the footage had been erased. If there was camera footage that was erased or destroyed, then it could be considered spoliation of evidence, and there are legal consequences for this. I personally couldn't find anything that says that footage was erased, but with all the other inconsistencies I have found in this case, it honestly would not surprise me at this point. So throughout my research, I had stumbled across a couple theories of what may have happened to Tamla that evening, being that her death wasn't an accident. I think the most popular theory of what happened to Tamla that night is that she was attacked shortly after the game Cards Against Humanity was done being played. To give this context, there was a video that was found on someone's cell phone of Tamla having a conversation with another guest, Jen, in the kitchen. And according to Tamla's husband, Leander, Tamla did not look happy and he could just tell from her body language in the video. Also, you can tell in the video that Jen is not paying any mind to what Tamla is saying. So was this just the beginning to a heated argument, which then possibly led to a full assault on Tamla? Well, what I think makes this plausible are the injuries that Tamla had to her body and face, and the fact that they do line up with a possible defense struggle. But the only problem is we may never know since there were no photos taken of Tamla's body during the initial autopsy. Another theory I and many other people speculate to be very plausible in this case is that Tamla got into a physical altercation while she was rejecting a sexual advance from one of the men present the night of the party. I think that this is possible because of the fact that Tamla may have had Xanax in her system at the time, and when you mix Xanax with alcohol, you may have just entered blackout mode. After everyone had gone upstairs that night, one of the men has said he returned downstairs to grab his charger, and he noticed Tamla was alone in the kitchen. So was this the prime opportunity to make a move on Tamla when no one else was around? I don't know, but it seems to be a very popular theory as to what may have happened. Also, I have read that there were two different kinds of cigarettes that were found on the balcony from that night. So if Tamla really was going out for a smoke before bed like she was said to have, then my thoughts are she wasn't alone. 
So in conclusion to these two theories, I do speculate that something happened to Tamla Horsford that night, and it wasn't an accident. There's just too many inconsistencies with stories from the partygoers, the investigation and autopsy were a total mess, and it honestly just doesn't make any sense to me that Tamla died from accidentally falling from a second story balcony. Like Tamla's husband Leander had said before, quote, I don't mind it being an accident, but make it make sense, unquote. So before I conclude this episode, I wanted everyone to keep a few questions about this case in their mind, and I thought these questions fit well, given we don't have all the answers in this case. The first question we should all be asking in this case is, why were other people allowed to leave the party that night, but Tamla wasn't? We know from Tom, Stacy, and Bridget that Tamla spoke about wanting to go home at one point, so why didn't she? Tamla could have tried to call her husband for a ride or even just called an Uber, but for some reason, she didn't. And in fact, her phone wasn't even with her when she was found deceased the next day. It had been left inside by the kitchen. Next question I and many people probably have is, when Aunt Madeline first discovered Tamla's body in the backyard, why didn't she call 911 right away? Why did she have to go upstairs twice to try and get Jose first? Again, no one that was present at the crime scene that morning ever tried to administer CPR on Tamla, and Jose knew CPR, but instead he attempted to bend her leg to see if rigor mortis set in. And I'm sorry that I have to say this again, but it sounds like somebody already may have known. And last question I have is about the imported tequila bottle Tamla was drinking from during the party. One party goer Marcy had told law enforcement in her interview that there was about one fourth of the bottle gone from the party, but for some reason the next morning law enforcement had put in the report that there was only an eighth of the bottle left. So my question is, did someone pour out most of the tequila to make Tamla look like she was more drunk than she initially was? I think this could be plausible because the drunker Tamla was from the night, the more believable the accident theory becomes. Now, in conclusion to this episode, there are tons of unanswered questions in the case, but those are a few I just wanted to put out there, and I think in order for Tamla and her family to find justice in this case, someone from that party that night needs to start doing some talking. But the worst part is, we just may never know what did actually happen to Tamla Horsford the very early morning hours of November 4th, 2018. So again, check out the Tamla Horsford Forsyth Exposed YouTube channel. It's got tons of information on the case, included with all the interviews that have been conducted in this case, and really try to form your own opinion on what you think may have happened in this story. Tamla has a ton of great support out there right now, so please share Tamla's story with someone you know and help this case get the publicity it deserves. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to this episode. Tamla's case was not an easy case to try and put together, so again, I hope I was able to summarize a lot of the main points in this case and really give you a sense of where this case has gone to in the past couple years. Now for my next episode on Drew Crime, I will be looking into the questionable unsolved case of Arpana Janaga. This case involves a 24-year-old girl who was murdered in her apartment on November 1st, 2008 in Redmond, Washington. Arpana's apartment complex was having a big Halloween party the night she was killed, and everyone seemed to know who may have done it. But after one man was tried twice and then acquitted of the murder charges, the mystery surrounding Arpana's death still remains. So thank you again, everyone, for tuning into the podcast. Do check out my Drew Crime YouTube channel if you have time. And always my friendly reminder, love everyone, but trust no one. I am your host, Drew V, and you've been listening to Drew Crime. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Drew Crime. I'm your